Good morning, church. How good to see you this morning. It is good to be together to worship, and we continue our worship now as we prepare to open our Bibles. But let's go to the Lord together in prayer first, and then we'll open our Bibles together. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we praise You and thank You for Your goodness toward us. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, Your grace and Your mercy is obvious at Calvary, at the shed blood of our Lord and Savior. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Spirit. And now we come to open our Bibles and hear You speak to us from the pages of our Bibles. We pray that You would speak into our hearts, speak into our lives with Your truth, and encourage us and strengthen us to walk with You by faith each day this week. Lord, help us now. Help us in this hour. Help us with Your Word to apply this to our own hearts and lives. You know just what we need. You know every situation represented in this room and each life. And we know that through the power of Your Word and and by Your Spirit, You can speak to each of us and into each situation with Your Word today. And we ask You to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have your Bible today? I hope you do. hope you bring your Bible. Turn with me to the little book of Colossians in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1. We'll turn there together. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 20 this morning. But I want to start reading at verse 12 for the sake of context. So look at Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, and follow along as I read from the English Standard Version, verses 12 through 20. So Colossians 1, beginning at verse 12, where it says, "...giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Our last time... As we looked at this uh, first chapter in Colossians, and as we continue our study this morning, our last time here, we heard how Paul and Timothy were praying for the believers at Colossae. Praying for the believers that made up the church at Colossae, that they would be strengthened, verse 11, with power, with all power, according to His glorious might. That's, That's the power of Jesus Christ to save sinners. And that's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of the Word and the Spirit to strengthen believers to live for Him each day. And here's Paul writing to these believers at Colossae. And Paul's concern for these believers because of the false teaching they were facing. And we know they were facing false teaching. We can see pointers to it here in uh, this book of Colossians as we'll study through. We're going to see pointers to the different kinds of false teaching they were facing. And because of the false teaching they were facing, it caused him to be concerned for them, and he wanted them to have a foundation, a firm foundation to base their faith on. And there's no greater and a firmer foundation than that of knowing who Jesus is. And so here he is, and we just read it, and here he is speaking about now, after he's told them he's praying for them and how he's praying for them, now he begins to paint this wonderful picture, this wonderful scene of who Jesus is. And we're seeing it here in the text. Uh, Interestingly, the Bible commentator Warren Wearsby writes about this, and he says the results of these false teachings were tragic, the things that these uh, believers at Colossae were facing. He says the results of these false teachings were tragic. 
including extreme asceticism. Uh, do you use that word very much, asceticism? It, it means severe self-discipline. Uh, we usually don't enjoy that, do we? We don't do that much. But here are these people become going, being led by false teachers, beginning to ex- extremely discipline themselves to the extreme, that, that extreme asceticism. So, so that was on the one hand, he says, Wearsby says on the one hand, and then unbridled sin on the other, which he says, after all, if your body is sinful... You have two choices. If your body is sinful, you either try to enslave it or you enjoy it. So Warren Wearsby points to the problem that these believers were facing. Another Bible commentator, A.M. Hodgkin, points out that the real dangers which threatened the church at Colossae, the deceitful philosophy of the Gnostics, which sent God, uh, set God on one side and gave itself to worship of angels and legalism on another side, and forced asceticism. There's that word again from A.M. Hodgkin. Uh, he says, he points out that this extreme false teaching led Paul to call forth this marvelous description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a marvelous description. Did you hear it as I read it? And as you looked at it in your copy of God's Word, this wonderful description of who Jesus is, because uh, if there's one thing we need when it comes to false teaching, when we're facing false teaching and false teachers and mistruths and lies, outright, outright lies, and the culture we live in is actually telling us all kinds of lies that go in direct opposition to God's Word. If, what, if, uh, if we're facing that, what we desperately need is to know who Jesus is and why He came and what He does and what He has accomplished. And so because of the false teaching these believers are facing that attack the, the deity of Jesus Christ, attacked this fact that He was God in human flesh, Paul knew that what they needed and what every believer in every age needs is to understand clearly the marvelous truth about who Jesus is. This is what we need today. You may not have come here thinking you needed to learn about Jesus, and whether you've heard these things before is beside the point. We need to hear them again. We need to know these truths about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to apply them to our lives and our hearts every day. Believers in Jesus Christ need to be firmly grounded in who Jesus is. This is what we need today. This is what we're going to need every day until the Lord calls us home or returns for us. And we need to remind ourselves of these truths. And so we we need to focus on this. We need to focus on the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is supreme over all. We sang about it this morning, several songs. We sang about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Scriptures speak clearly about the Lord Jesus Christ being supreme over all. And Paul's description of the supremacy of Jesus Christ is like that beautiful landscape. Have you ever approached a grand scene out of nature, an incredible landscape, and then been struck by, by awe, uh, with awe at the beauty of it. And you just are breathtaking. You stand there and you look at it. This is incredible to see a beautiful landscape like that. When that happens, all you want to do is just stand there. Isn't that right? You just want to stand there and stay and look. And you don't want to be in a hurry. You don't want to have to leave. Just enjoy the view. Take it in. Look and look and soak it in. Uh, we had an experience like that uh, several years ago when we camped in the Upper Peninsula for a week. And and one day, on a day trip, we went to the Porcupine Mountains. Have you ever been to the Porcupine Mountains? Uh, We had never been, and we had heard about it. We didn't really know what was up there, but we knew we we wanted to drive up to the top. And so we drove up, and and I remember passing these signs. Uh, There were some campsites on the way up uh, beside the road, and it said... um, you know, like hang your hang your food up high. It's like, oh, there's bears. Yeah, we saw bears down down low. It was kind of funny. We stopped to get a treat. I think there was a like a dairy shack there, and and there was a fence behind the between the woods and the parking lot. And the bears, we could see the bears come down behind the fence, and and they would throw food over the fence to the bears. I'm not sure that's the greatest idea, but but the bears would come right down and, and uh, eat behind the fence, uh, behind these little fast food joints. But anyway, we drove over the top of the hill, and we got there, and we were hungry, so we broke out our lunch, and we ate. We still didn't know what we were going to see at the top, but we, there we were at the top. And then we walked the short little trail that breaks out into an overlook. Have you been there? 
Some of you have been there to see. You know what I'm going to talk about. Some of you, when you do the little short walk to the overlook and you walk out and there's this huge lake up, up on top of the mountain. It's called Lake of the Clouds. It is incredible. It's beautiful. It took my breath away. I just wanted to stand there, but we had little kids then and you know, you can't stand very still for very long with little kids and we had to get going. But man, it is a sight that I will never forget. It's engraved in my memory because every time I see a picture of the Lake of the Clouds, I go, that's the Lake of the Clouds. Because <laughs> I've been there and I've seen it. And it's a stunning view. We've come to a passage in God's Word that is a stunning view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to bring you to this passage this morning, and I want to slow down, and I want to think about it for a moment, because I want you to see the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ given to us in God's Word. This is a stunning view that we ought not be in a hurry to move on from, that we ought to let saturate our hearts and souls and minds with the truth of what we're going to see here. And there, there's hardly a better passage in Scripture than this one to see who Jesus is and His supremacy over all. This is such an important topic for us all, because if you can grasp and understand how supreme Jesus is, how supreme He is over all things, and how sufficient He is for all of life, every area of life, and all of godliness, then you will have no need to be drawn to any kind of false teaching that would lead you away and harm your spiritual life. You will have no need to be drawn away from any other or to any other source or, or necessary knowledge or anything you might think is necessary other than your knowledge of who Jesus is and how He is revealed from beginning to end in God's Word. You need to know how supreme Jesus Christ is for the health of your spiritual growth, your spiritual life, your walk with Christ. So first, I want you to think about this. Here's, here's the first part of the scenery of who Jesus is and His supremacy, uh, supremacy. We see the supremacy of Jesus Christ in His relationship to creation. He speaks about it here. Now, one of the things that the believers at Colossae were dealing with, one of the false teachings which Paul is confronting here, is the teaching that Jesus wasn't fully divine. That He wasn't fully God and that Jesus wasn't the sole source of redemption from sins. And so what Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to lay out clearly who Jesus is and how powerful He is over everything. So look back with me at verses 13 and 14, and you'll see that Paul concluded his prayer with this powerful truth about Jesus Christ. He has, it says in verse 13, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have... Here's what we have in Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So how does God deliver sinners from the domain of darkness and transfer us or transplant us to the kingdom of light? How does He do that? He does it through Jesus Christ. He does it through Christ. How can Jesus redeem you? How can He be capable of providing for you forgiveness of sin? The answer is in verse 15. He can because, look at verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is God in human flesh. God is invisible. We know that. You cannot see God today. I cannot see God today. Yet, Yet, there are indicators, there is evidence of God all around us. Romans one twenty points out that the whole world is aware of God's existence because of His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, which have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. No one has an excuse if you can see or perceive, even if you can't see, you can perceive that there's an incredible creation all around us. Incredible creation. There is, there is a God. 
It is obvious in the world in which we live. So even though you can't see God, His divine nature is obvious throughout creation. But in Jesus, here's what God did. God revealed Himself to humankind in the flesh. Jesus came, took on flesh, born as a babe, and lived a sinless life. God in human flesh. God's representation of Himself to mankind in the flesh. And note that this does not mean that Jesus is merely like God. Jesus isn't just kind of like God. No, He is God. Hebrews 1.3 says of Jesus Christ that He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the Word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. So Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, and because He is God's revelation of Himself to mankind, as verse 15 continues, He is the firstborn of all creation. Now, note here, be careful here, when you hear that phrase, He's the firstborn of all creation. This does not mean that Jesus was created. does not mean that. He is not a created being. Being firstborn of all creation is pointing to the truth that Jesus is preeminent over all. He's preeminent overall. In fact, verse 16 and verse 17 confirm this truth. Look at them again. Look at verse 16. For by Him all things were created. Which things? All things. Including things in heaven and on earth. Anything else? Keep looking at it. Yes, yes, more. Things visible and invisible. Anything else? Yes, all things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, authorities, all things were created through Him and, get this, for Him. For Him? This is pointing to how the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified by all things. These are created for His glory. And then verse 17 says, and He is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. Jesus Christ is supreme because He is the Creator of the universe. Jesus Christ existed before anything else because He is God. And we see Him in the Scriptures appearing as God in human flesh, walking this earth. This does not make Him less than God. He is still God, but He has taken on human flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ when He walked this earth. He is God. And not only do we learn here that Jesus Christ is the Creator, verse 17 says that He also continues to sustain all life. He sustains all things. So He is Lord over all creation. Now, if you know the One who is Lord over all creation, don't you think you ought to seek to glorify that One with your life? That's what God's Word is about, helping us learn how to honor the One who gave Himself for sinners with every area of our lives. Now, again, in Hebrews 1.3, it says of Jesus that He upholds the universe by the Word of His power. The problem through the ages has been, and it it remains to this day, as preacher and Bible commentator Ligon Duncan notes that he says, today there are many people who belong to denominations of Christian churches that do not believe that Jesus is divine. Could that be you today, that you You're being challenged with something you don't believe, that Jesus is God in human flesh. He goes on to say, they believe that Jesus was a good man 
They believe that he had wise sayings. They believe that he had things that he taught that could help us in our daily living. But they do not believe that he is divine. As far as the Apostle Paul is concerned, if Jesus is not divine, we are undone. We might as well give it all up, pack it in, and go home. Because if Jesus is not divine, He cannot release us from the powers of darkness. He cannot free us from sin. He cannot bring us into the glorious light of God. And we are still in our sins, the Apostle Paul says. How is it that Jesus Christ could qualify the Colossian believers and qualify you and me if we put our faith and trust in Him to share in the inheritance of the saints of light, as verse 12 says. How? How could Jesus possibly deliver believers in Him from the domain of darkness and transfer us to His kingdom? How can He do that? He can do it, and He does do it because He is God who took on flesh and came and lived a sinless life, and then went to the cross and suffered a cruel death, yes, at the hands of sinful men, but a part of God's plan was for Him to be crucified for sinners. And then He was buried, and then He rose from the dead on the third day. That's the supremacy of Jesus Christ as seen in His relationship to creation we also get a glimpse of the supremacy of Jesus Christ in His relationship to the church. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. So, Not only is Jesus Christ supreme over creation, He is supreme over the church. He is the head of the body. We know what the body is because it tells us here, the church. An important outworking of this truth is is that since Jesus is the head of the body, the church, He is the church's and the believer's first and final authority. He is our first and final authority. This is so important. This is so important for us today because there is no authority for the church and the believer other than Jesus Christ and His Word. There is no authority for the church or for believers in Jesus Christ than than He and His Word. No one can come along and tell you to live in any other way than what the way the Bible reveals to us, God's Word, the Word of Christ. Anyone who comes along and makes him or herself head over the church, departing from the truth of Scripture, is not teaching God's Word and is not working by God's appointment. You can only be a child of God because of Jesus Christ. You can only be forgiven your sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance, that's turning from your sin, saying, I know I'm a sinner, I want to be saved. Praying to God and asking for that forgiveness and thanking Him for that forgiveness that is yours through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot come to be forgiven your sins without faith in the One who is supreme, faith in Jesus Christ. You can only gain spiritual wisdom, which Paul prayed the Colossian believers would be filled with, verse 9, because of the work of Jesus Christ. How does Jesus Christ do that work? He does it by way of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in each believer with the Word of Truth. You may have teachers. I may teach you things from the Scriptures. You may have other teachers who teach you things from the Scriptures. But it is because of Christ as the head of the church, as the source of all wisdom, that you can even gain spiritual wisdom. Because the the Holy Spirit is given to believers, poured into our hearts, poured into our souls, to have the presence of God to help us with the Word. This is why it's so important why I keep harassing you about bringing your Bible. I want you to be people of the book, the Word of God. 
to study God's Word, to read God's Word for yourself, and to not just say, I'll read the Word this year, and you'll read through it once, and I'll be done with it. No, to commit yourself to being readers for a lifetime of God's Word, because this is how the Holy Spirit works, with the truth of the Word. So important that we realize that what we have when it comes to spiritual growth and spiritual health is only ours because, not because we work hard for it. You might work hard for it, that's okay. But you have it because Jesus Christ is supreme over all. And He is at work in those who are believers in Him. Paul makes an important emphasis we're going to see it when we get to Colossians 2.19, but if you want to skip ahead, go look at chapter 2 with me briefly and look at verse 19. You can hear Paul emphasizing this truth in Colossians 2.19 when he gives a warning not to be deceived and to hold fast to the head of the church. Look at Colossians 2.19. Leading up to verse 19, Paul is basically warning them not to be deceived. He's warning these believers, and, and we're getting this warning too from the Scriptures as we look at this passage not to be deceived, because those who are spreading false teaching are not what he is challenging these believers to be in verse 19. So, verse 19, this is what we're to be. Holding fast to the head. Who's the head? Jesus. The head of what? The body. What's the body? The church. So here's the church. Believers are to hold fast to the head, Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body, the church, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Grows with a growth, hear that? That is from whom? It is from God. And we get a little glimpse here. I I, I don't like to give away too much before we get to chapter 2 and verse 19, but this is so important for us because if we really long to be a church that pleases God, we must realize that we are only strengthened by the work of God in His people when we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. We must submit to the Word, and if we do, collectively, look at it again, holding fast to the head, who, from whom the whole body, the church, nourished by what? The Word of God and the work of the Spirit are knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. We need to humble ourselves before the One who is supreme over all. As a church, collectively, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord Jesus Christ and humble ourselves before His Word. As individual believers, we desperately need this. You may not, you may not feel it in this moment, but there are going to be times in your life when you realize you need something. This is what you need. You need the supremacy of Jesus Christ clear in your mind, clear in your heart, that you would submit to Him and submit to His Word and seek to live for His glory in all that you do, all that you say. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, is the first and final source of all spiritual nourishment for every believer, for every church, for every true church that worships the one true God. And that is only possible because, as Paul says back in chapter 1, we can go back there now, verse 18, Jesus is, is the beginning, meaning He is the founder of new life. Just listen to Hebrews 2.10 for a moment, which says Jesus is the founder of our salvation. Hebrews 12.2 says Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. So believers in Jesus also have this wonderful future promise of resurrection because Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. This is only possible because of and through Jesus Christ's resurrection. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and because He rose from the dead, we can be assured of new life, new eternal life in Christ. If we die on earth, we will be resurrected with new bodies, with Christ. 
We praise God for that wonderful and future promise that's ours. That's what Paul means in verse 18 when he says that Jesus is firstborn from the dead because on the third day, Christ was raised from the dead. And we as followers of Jesus Christ have this hope and this promise of also being raised with Christ. And won't that be the day? Won't that be the day when we see Christ face to face? And so we see here the supremacy of Jesus Christ in His relationship to the church as well. And then also, next, we see Christ's relationship to God. We see His supremacy in His relationship to God. Look at verse 19. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. How is God... Pleased to have His fullness dwell in Christ. Here's a, here's a good uh, Bible study tip. If you want to dig deeper into the Scriptures, just come to the Scriptures and let questions come to your mind and just ask questions of the text. Well, how does that work? When you look at verse 19, and it says, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is the question that I come to. is that How is God pleased to have His fullness dwell in Christ? How does that please God? Here's how Jesus Christ... He is pleased in God to, to, to have all His fullness revealed in Him. It's because Jesus is fully God. God is pleased to have His fullness dwell in Christ, and He glorifies God with His fullness in Himself. He was not made God by God. You get that? Jesus Christ was not made God by God. He is fully God, as Colossians 2.9 states, for in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Again, we're reminded of the, the privilege of those who walk the earth when Jesus walked to be able to see God's representation of Himself in human flesh. And we see of Him in the Scriptures. And in Him, the whole fullness of God, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus, in the flesh, was not some of God and some of man. He was fully God while He was fully man. But how is it that God's pleasure is in Jesus demonstrating the fullness of God? I think we can see it in what follows in verse 20. Look at verse 20 again. And through Him, to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. How is it that God's pleasure is in Jesus demonstrating the fullness of God? It's demonstrated as Jesus shed His blood on the cross for sinners through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, it says in verse 20, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. We look at the cross and we rightly look at it as a terrible thing. But we also ought to look at it as a wonderful thing because the blood of the cross brings us peace. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we have this promise of peace. It's something we desperately need. You may not go around thinking, I just want peace, I just want peace. Well, sometimes you might say that when you're facing a particular difficulty. I just want peace. But this is what we desperately want, and this is what we desperately need, and Jesus gives it to us through the cross. And God's pleasure is, is seen in being glorified by Jesus, demonstrating God's love for mankind through the act of reconciliation and peacemaking, and all that by the blood of His cross. This wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ, this terrible sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is something that's amazing to us, that God would do this that God the Son would be sacrificed for sinners. But He makes peace and He reconciles us to Himself through this shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ glorified God by becoming the reconciler for those who could not reconcile themselves to God. You cannot make yourself right with God. 
You can work as hard as you want. You can try to obey God's commands in the flesh all you want. If you don't trust in Jesus Christ, you cannot be reconciled to God. Only Jesus can do that. Jesus Christ is the reconciler. He's God's appointed one. He's the one who reconciles us by the blood of His cross. And God is also glorified by Jesus Christ, making peace between God and men. See, there's no peace between God and men when we're His enemies. And we are His enemies when we're trapped in our sins and we do nothing that honors God because we're not trusting in Jesus Christ. But God is glorified by Jesus Christ making peace between God and men. And that peace is only possible because of the blood of His cross. Jesus Christ is the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins. And this is so liberating when you stop and think about it. That because Jesus Christ is the only acceptable sacrifice for sins, it is not required that you work to be forgiven your sins. You cannot work to be forgiven your sins. You can work, but you cannot be forgiven your sins by your good works. It's only by Jesus Christ's acceptable sacrifice at Calvary. All of this, all of this points to the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all and above all. Jesus Christ first over all things. So today, Jesus Christ being supreme over everything, should also have first place in our hearts. Shouldn't He? I mean, after what you've heard, after what we see here in Colossians, shouldn't Jesus have first place in our hearts if He is supreme over all and everything? You know, if He has first place in our hearts, That means He'll have our lives. That means we'll think about all kinds of things in every area of our life. We'll say, how how am I pleasing God in that way? How is my thought life pleasing God in this way? How are my actions pleasing God? Are my words pleasing to God? Is my work pleasing to God? Is my uh, marriage pleasing to God? Or is the way I'm raising my children pleasing to God? It's you, You might think that that's restraining, but it's liberating because it gives you hope that there is a way to please God. It is from the pages of our Bibles that we learn how to please God. It's where we learn who Jesus is and that He is supreme over all. And we come to this text this morning, we see this wonderful tapestry, this wonderful landscape, this beautiful scene that Paul paints for us of who Jesus is. And we must come to this point where we go, "Am am I making Jesus supreme in my life? He is supreme. He is supreme. Are you surrendering to Him? Are you humbling yourself before Him, putting Him as as first place in your life? Does Jesus Christ have first place in your heart and in your life? Are you trusting in Him as your Lord and Savior? You know, if that's not something you've done, if you've not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're hearing here this morning, again, you're hearing the good news, the gospel. And Jesus is calling to you from the pages of our Bibles to to trust in Him. From His Word, He he calls to you to, to believe in Him, to repent of sin and be saved. And you can do that even in this moment. Believers, Jesus is supreme over all. You don't make Him supreme. He is supreme. Your responsibility is to put Him first in your life. Are you doing that? I'll admit, that is a daily challenge. That is a daily challenge that God calls His people to take up and take personally. And I would challenge you this week to come back to this passage and look at these verses again. Look at verses 15 through 20 and just pray over these verses this week and ask God to help you put Jesus first in your life. First in your thought life. First in your conversations. First in your work life. First in how you raise your children. First in how you respond to your parents and to your siblings and your friends. Believers, will you put Jesus first? Will you?
He is supreme. He deserves first place. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, oh, how we praise You today that Jesus is Your revelation to us in human flesh, the image of the invisible God. We praise You that Jesus created and now sustains all life, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And we we praise You that Jesus makes peace by the blood of His cross for all whose faith is in Him. So Lord, because Jesus is supreme over all things and everyone, help us. Help us to humble ourselves before Christ. Help us to humble ourselves before You to see to it that Jesus has first place in our hearts, in our lives, so that we might look to Him in faith and live every day for His glory. Lord, help us with that today and every day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.